In this video, I'll discuss the ocular head options for Puma. If we consider the filter block to be the neck of the microscope, then any module that fits on top of it and completes the scope by allowing viewing of the sample is called a head. Puma has a range of head modules that can be used for direct viewing, various camera attachments, or both simultaneously. Because all these modules have at least one option to include an ocular lens for direct viewing, they are called ocular heads, but this term is retained even for those variants that allow direct chip camera projection without an ocular. The simplest ocular head is the fixed viewing angle monocular, that viewing angle being straight up. There are two options for this module. One is designed to take an eyepiece for either direct vision or a focal eyepiece projection photography. The other is a shortened version designed to take a C-mount camera for direct chip projection imaging. Details on attaching a camera to this C-mount tube are discussed in the How to Build section towards the end of this video. These two methods of camera imaging were discussed in the video on epi-illumination, but they can also be used with any type of illumination. Another type of C-mount camera imaging uses a reduction optic designed to fit into the eyepiece holder of the standard ocular tube. With this type of C-mount imaging, the reduction optic acts as a beam reducer to shrink the image beam down so you get more of the field of view on the camera sensor chip. If you're using this type of reduction optic with Puma, you'll probably find that it's difficult to insert into the ocular tube unless you remove this rubber band they often include on the barrel. Be sure when you insert it into the scope that you insert the barrel of the adapter all the way so the flange of the seam mount reduction optic rests on the ocular cap as shown here, and do not leave any gap. Bear in mind that when using an eyepiece, the ocular cap gap of 2 mm that was discussed in the video on how to build a foundation scope is only valid if you have no filters or other optics in between the objective and the ocular lens, or C-mount optics. If the advanced filter block is used, or any filters are placed in any filter block, then you need to increase the ocular cap gap according to the formula and methods discussed in the section on the binocular head described later in this video. These monocular tubes have a long, unbroken, straight light path. If this were implemented as a simple tube, it could be a source of internal reflections, which cause low contrast bright region artifacts in the image, as illustrated in the video on Kühler illumination. For that reason, Puma's fixed monocular tubes have a specially designed system of internal light baffles built into them, which act to prevent internal reflections. In the more complex ocular heads described later, there are several interfaces in the 3D printed housings that incidentally act as light baffles to prevent internal reflections, so dedicated light baffles are not required. Advantages of the fixed angle monocular head are that it's easy to build and there are no intervening optics that could get dusty or distort the image or cause light loss. It is therefore the best choice for low light level viewing or critical photomicrography. Disadvantages include You can only make one type of observation at a time, with either a single camera or a single direct vision ocular, but not both. It is very uncomfortable to look vertically straight down a scope for any length of time. It is also uncomfortable to look down a scope with just one eye for long periods. The straight-up light path is not very compact, so detracts from Puma's aim of ultra-portability. There are, however, remedies for these disadvantages. For example, the trinocular camera port, described in a separate video, can be used to attach a camera simultaneously with any ocular head including the monocular or vice versa, it can act as a direct fission port when a camera is used on the main ocular head. The whole scope can be tilted backwards using the shorter back leg on the stand. This places the ocular tube at a 35 degree angle which is much more comfortable for direct viewing. The binocular head module, which I'll describe shortly, 
was designed to make prolonged viewing more comfortable by letting the observer use both eyes. The other ocular head modules discussed in this video allow some folding of the light path, which makes the scope even more compact, and they can provide even better solutions to the awkward straight-up viewing angle which do not require tilting the whole scope. While tilting the whole scope backwards gives a more comfortable viewing angle, in some cases it may not be desirable or practical. For example, when looking at fluid samples or using oil immersion, the oil or fluid might pool and drip backwards if the scope is tilted. For these reasons I designed a dedicated adjustable angle monocular module which uses two first surface mirrors to allow the user to rotate the viewing angle over a wide range for more comfortable ergonomic viewing without tilting the scope stage at all. Because only first surface full mirrors are used, there is no significant wastage of the light from the objective, and the mirrors are thick solid elements so are not prone to bending and image distortion. They also avoid the aberrations caused by glass prisms, which are an alternative method of reflecting light. The disadvantages of this module over the simple monocular is that it takes more work to build and needs more components. The viewing arm of the ergo monocular uses exactly the same components as the lower limb of the binocular head, so the mechanisms for adjusting the angle and the options and methods for attaching various cameras as well as the use of spacers and the correct setting of the ocular cap gap are exactly the same as will be described shortly for the binocular head. Although there is no interpupillary distance adjustment necessary with this module, you will need to include a mirror block tube spacer in order to get the required clearance for free rotation of the mirror block tube without the ocular assembly impacting on the ergo monocular mirror block. A 2.5mm spacer should suffice. If you're going to be looking down the microscope for long periods of time, it's much more comfortable to use both eyes simultaneously. This is why most professional microscopes have binocular heads. The basic optical path in the Puma binocular head was introduced in the video on beam splitters. In addition to the central beam splitter block, there are two 45 degree ocular mirror mounts, and these direct the image beam upwards to the oculars. The part of the ocular mirror mount that actually houses the 45 degree mirror is called the mirror block, and these mirror blocks fit into and slide along a mirror block tube, or MBT, on each side. They also have built into them a tri-screw mirror angle adjustment mechanism, which is used to do fine alignment of the image position so that the image seen by each eye is the same. This alignment is important for comfortable binocular vision and will be described in more detail later. The mirror block tubes fit into the outlets of the splitter block via these screw and shim pressure fittings in a sliding arc slot which allows for a large degree of rotational freedom and a smaller degree of translational freedom. So, unlike most microscopes, Puma's binocular head module is very versatile and can be used for multiple purposes. In fact, there are four uses for it. One, as a binocular viewer for one person. Two, as a double header, double monocular viewer, so two people can look down the microscope together at the same time. Three, as an ergo monocular head for one viewer where the viewing angle can be adjusted without tilting the whole scope. And four, as a camera attachment port for one or two cameras simultaneously. I'll now discuss each of these uses in more detail. Before I move on to the next part of this video, I would ask that if you like these Puma videos, please take a second to support the project by clicking on the big red subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. If you have social media accounts, also please share these videos on them using the YouTube share button. Ok, now back to the rest of this video. Any binocular head must have some means of adjusting to the specific interpupillary distance, or IPD, of each user. In population studies, it was found that the IPD can vary in adults 
with an extreme range between 50 mm and over 70 mm. The mean is around 64 mm with a standard deviation of about 4 mm. This means a binocular viewer must have the ability to place the eyepieces closer together or further apart while keeping the overall optical path length the same. This was a difficult design challenge to fulfill within the Puma design constraints, which keep Puma portable and affordable, namely, the whole mechanism must be built into the 90 mm of optical tube length that is left after the filter block ends, without the use of tube lenses to lengthen that path, and the mechanism must be implemented in 3D printing with minimal non-printed components, and even those must be generic, affordable and widely available to anyone. Many professional microscopes have a precision mechanism to adjust the IPD with gears that automatically shorten or lengthen the eyepiece holders as you increase or decrease the gap between them, so as to maintain a constant optical path length. This kind of smooth precision mechanism is difficult to achieve in 3D printed plastic over the required range of motion. Other microscopes adopt a rotational mechanism which changes the IPD by placing the eyepieces wider apart or closer together on a circular path and so does not require auto lengthening or shortening of the eyepiece holders because the linear path length to each eyepiece at each IPD is always the same, being the radius of the rotation arc. While this rotational motion is more practical to achieve in 3D printing, there simply is not enough room in the 90 mm of focusing path length available to a Puma ocular head to implement this mechanism. For these reasons, I had to make some compromises for the Puma binocular head. For example, it was not possible for me to make Puma cover the whole range of adult IPD, so I took a pragmatic approach to aim for the mean plus or minus at least two standard deviations, and the mechanism I finally came up with has an IPD range between 59 and 73 millimeters. If your IPD is outside this range, you won't be able to use the Puma binocular head for binocular vision. The Puma IPD adjustment is achieved via a manual sliding mechanism where the required IPD is fixed with a custom number of spacers in these mirror block tubes as shown. Once you find the correct length of spacer for your IPD, which must be equal on both sides, you simply hold the mirror block in place with this light shield cap and ring nut system. You must be careful not to tighten these ring nuts too much, because the pressure on the ocular mirror mount is all concentrated at this upper point, so there is a tendency for the ocular mirror mount to rotate inwards. Using minimum pressure with these ring nuts, just enough to stop free motion of the ocular mirror mount will help minimize this effect, but any residual in-turning can be counteracted by this adjustable cap spacer, which you clip onto the plastic ocular caps as shown. Then separate the spacer arms to provide the desired counterforce to straighten the oculus and tighten the thumb screw to keep it in position. Ensure the elbow of the spacer faces forwards to give good clearance for your nose. You can also use this spacer clip mechanism to effect a fine adjustment of IPD, but it's not recommended because this varies the angles of the ocular mirror blocks, so will tend to throw the images in the two eyepieces out of alignment with each other. Once the IPD is set, you must manually adjust the height of each eyepiece to establish the correct optical path length. First, note that you need an ocular extension module on the lower arm of the beam splitter to bring the two eyepieces to the same level. The ocular extension on its own gives exactly 15 mm of increased height, but the two arms of the beam splitter are separated by 15.5 mm, so you just add this 0.5 mm spacer to the extension and screw it on fully. No extension is used on the upper arm. To achieve the range of IPD stated above, 
you will need to include this ocular spacer ring between the ocular cap and each eyepiece. Finally, use the ocular cap thread and lock nut mechanism to vary the ocular cap gap, or OCG, between the inner brim of the ocular cap and the top of the ocular mounting thread, to the value that is specified for your particular IPD as calculated using the formula shown. Some example OCG values are also shown here for some IPDs. With regards to adjusting the OCG, note that the ocular thread is designed such as it moves vertically 2 mm for every full 360 degree turn. Using this knowledge, you can adjust the gap to a high degree of precision, starting from a gap of zero. For example, to set the gap to 4.5 mm, just unscrew the cap two and a quarter turns, like so. Bear in mind that these OCG settings are calculated on the basis that there are no intervening optics or filters between the objective lens and the binocular head. If you're using the advanced filter block, and or any filters in any filter block, you will need to increase the OCG by an appropriate amount to compensate for the extra focus distance incurred by the beam travelling through those optics. This extra amount is calculated by the formula shown. You can make this compensation by increasing the OCG by the full amount, or, if that is not practical, you can always print and use additional ocular spacer rings to make up all or part of the compensatory distance. If using the C-mount extension instead of an ocular cap assembly, you will need to raise the extension by the required amount, using its thread and lock nut mechanism. This IPD variation mechanism is less convenient than the automatic mechanisms of other scopes, but it works, and it only needs to be done once for any particular user. In order to accommodate the required range of IPD, I also had to keep the central splitter block very small, using the 2 cm square beam splitter and mirror in favour of larger optics, and that is quite apart from the fact that larger optics would be more expensive. However, this introduced another compromise. Not all the beam is used by the upper full mirror because it has expanded too much by the time it reaches here. This cropping of the imaging beam at the upper mirror, together with the extra aberrations caused as light passes through the glass of the beam splitter, mean that the image coming out of the upper outlet of the beam splitter will be of lower quality than the image coming out of the lower outlet you may see a slight shadow on the extreme periphery of the field of view in the image from the upper outlet. This difference in image quality from the two outlets may be significant if you are doing any photomicrography, image analysis, or imaging at the limits of resolution. It would always be better in these circumstances to use the image from the lower outlet or avoid the use of the binocular head altogether. Also, as many people have a dominant eye for vision, in a similar way to being left or right-handed, I designed two alternative ocular base thread modules. One of them positions the higher quality lower outlet of the beam splitter to the left eye, and the other one positions it to the right eye. So you can choose which gets the best image for you to maximize comfortable binocular viewing if you have a dominant eye. Setting the correct IPD is important, but is only part of the adjustment needed for comfortable binocular viewing. You also need to ensure that the image in each eyepiece is the same in rotation and XY shift. This registration process usually only need be done once. It doesn't change with different IPD as long as you don't swap the ocular assemblies between the sides. Make the following adjustments as required while looking down each eyepiece alternately and concentrate on features near the periphery of the field of view. Note that the image magnification seen down one eyepiece may be slightly different from the other, so you need to aim for the best overall compromise in image registration. You'll never get it 100% perfect. The rotation adjustment of each ocular image is done by rotating the mirror block tube. The nominally correct position is with the MBT level with this flat part of the splitter outlet. Only slight, if any, deviation from this will be needed if the system has been put together correctly. Note that rotating both MBTs in the same direction as each other causes the images in each eyepiece to rotate in opposite directions to each other. 
This means that you cannot tilt both eyepieces forwards or backwards together to find an ergonomically comfortable viewing angle for binocular vision. The correct viewing angle for the binocular head in this binocular viewing mode will be essentially straight up, just as for the simple monocular head. Once you've got rotational alignment between the two ocular images, proceed to get XY translational alignment by using the tri-screw adjustment mechanism on each 45 degree mirror. To do this, you first need to remove the light shields to access the adjust screws. Just use the ring nuts on their own, but remember to replace the light shields when alignment is done. Bear in mind that only slight adjustments are possible here. You need to do a bit of give and take from both mirrors. Don't try to do all the correction in one side alone. Having said that, if you do get an edge shadow in the field from the upper splitter block outlet, try to make your alignment with most or all of that shadow out of the field of view for best viewing experience. This shadow is seen more severely with higher magnification objectives, so it may be best to do this alignment using the highest magnification objective you intend to use. For best results, you may need to iterate between adjusting rotational alignment and XY alignment. It's worth the effort to get this right because you don't need to repeat this procedure once set and bad alignment makes for uncomfortable viewing. If you find there is not sufficient adjustment room in either XY or rotation or both, then recheck the construction of the binocular head components, including the ocular mirror mounts and the attachment of the mirror block tubes to the central beam splitter and the placement of the optics in the central beam splitter. Any small bit of stray plastic or imperfect insertion of a mirror or beam splitter could be causing the issue. Also ensure the two eyepieces are identical in type and parallel vertically, not pointing inwards or outwards. The use of the binocular head as a double header allows for viewing of the specimen by two people simultaneously, without the need for cameras and monitors. Not only is this in keeping with Puma's ultra-portable ethos, but it also allows each viewer to see the whole microscope field in complete optical resolution, unlike a camera monitor system. This application is greatly facilitated by the use of the AR projector HUD with its interactive pointer so the observers can point structures out to each other as part of the discussion. The use of the binocular head as a double header simply involves rotating one MBT forwards and one backwards. Note that for maximum rotation, you need to use the extreme screw hole positions instead of the default middle ones. Although the rotational position of the image will be completely different for one viewer compared to the other, you should align the system so that the same XY field of view is present for both viewers. This is so that both viewers can see the same structures at the periphery of their field of view, so that if one viewer points to a structure, it will be present in the field of view for the other viewer, regardless of the rotational difference. As discussed previously, you cannot tilt both oculars forward or backward together for ergonomic binocular vision due to the differential field rotation. This means that if you need an ergonomic viewing angle for binocular vision, just as with the fixed angle, monocular head, you have to use the short back leg on the scope to tilt the whole scope backwards to 35 degrees. But, as discussed earlier, this has drawbacks. In such cases, you can keep the scope level and simply rotate the MBT of one ocular to a convenient viewing angle. The other ocular can be used to attach a camera or just not used at all. If you don't want a second ocular lens in place, you should remove the MBT and cover the unused splitter block outlet to protect the optics from dust and stray light. In regards to minimizing back reflected light, it is best to cap this off with a light sink module. And for this reason, the CMBB cover model is provided, which has a condenser thread on it to allow you to affix the epi condenser light sink here. You can't use the epi black body modules here because these were designed to be used down at the level of the advanced filter block, where the aperture of the imaging beam is small. Up at the level of the binocular beam splitter, the imaging beam is spread too large to fit into that small aperture, so we use the epi condenser instead, without a condenser aperture disc. 
see the video on epi illumination for more details on the epi condenser. Note that with the binocular head used as an ergo monocular, you are effectively wasting 50% of the available light. For bright field imaging and some epi illumination modes, this may not be a problem, as the Puma LED is very bright. However, for dark field and epifluorescence, it could be an issue. The dedicated ergo monocular head module described previously avoids these limitations. When connecting cameras to the binocular head module, bear in mind the following principles. 1. The image from the upper outlet of the splitter block will be of lower quality to the image from the lower outlet. 2. Remember that Puma, being made of plastic articulations, suffers from wobble during focus and other movements of the scope. The binocular head is quite a heavy and bulky module as is, and is only just usable because its weight is symmetrically arranged. Adding any camera that is heavier than an eyepiece can exaggerate the wobble and make the fine focusing difficult, especially if the weight is unevenly distributed. It is for these reasons that I tend to use lightweight camera modules. Without some special measures to enhance support, it would be impractical to use heavy cameras like a DSLR with any ocular head module and especially with the binocular head. 3. Any exposed eyepiece can be a source of stray light entering the scope and spoiling the image, so cover any unused eyepieces when doing photomicrography, optimally with a light sink or matte black cover. A focal eyepiece projection may be used on either or both oculars of the binocular head. This was demonstrated previously when I showed you how the image in each eyepiece rotates with rotation of the mirror block tubes. A further demonstration of simultaneous camera imaging will be shown in the video on the trinocular camera port. To either outlet you can also attach a direct chip projection C-mount camera using the CMBB cover module to which is attached a short ocular thread module called CM Tube Short. To this tube, you can then attach the standard Puma C mount ocular extension and lock nut, as will be described shortly. When attaching the CMBB cover module to the splitter block outlet, you may need to use four screws if the C mount camera is not lightweight. Otherwise, the two central screws should be sufficient. If you're going to be using a heavier camera, then you may need to rig up some custom support for it so as not to bend or imbalance the optical tube system of the Puma. If using the C-mount attachment system with the lower outlet of the splitter block, you need to remember to add the 15mm ocular spacer with its 0.5mm additional spacer ring before adding the C-mount ocular extension. This is also true if you use the C-mount system with the dedicated ergomonocular head. These are the parts and the tools you'll need to build the ocular head modules. Details are provided in the video description. Thanks to Puma's modular ethos, the build instructions for many of these parts were covered in previous videos, so will not be repeated here. The simple monocular head was dealt with in the video on how to build the foundation scope. That video also showed you the adjustable ocular holder parts, which are common to all viewports that accept an eyepiece. The C-mount variant of the monocular head comprises a shortened ocular tube, a lock nut and C-mount ocular extension. The ocular tube is printed and finished in much the same way as the simple monocular tube, so no additional instruction is required. The lock nut is the same as used for the other ocular holder attachments. The C-mount ocular extension is printed and finished similar to the standard 15mm ocular extension component described in the video on how to build the foundation scope, but in this case you need to clean up and train this fine C thread with a metal female C thread to ensure its action is smooth prior to use, and take care to remove any dust arising from this process. Many modern compact C mount cameras actually use the CS standard distance from the mount to the chip, which is about 5mm shorter than the classic C mount distance. Therefore, a metal C to CS adapter should be threaded onto the plastic C thread for use with these cameras. This not only places the camera chip at the correct position to catch the primary objective image, 
but it also gives the plastic C-mount monocular assembly a final metal C thread on top, which is easier and more reliable and durable to use. Note that many good quality C or CS mount cameras will have some focus adjustment of the distance to the chip so you can fine tune the distance as required to compensate for filters in the beam path, such as the infrared block filter of the camera or the use of any filters in the Puma filter block. The Puma lock nut mechanism also provides for a degree of extension of the standard distance in case your camera does not have this. The nominally correct default position for the C-mount ocular extension is for it to be fully threaded onto the monocular tube CM thread or the CM tube short thread that is used in the binocular head beam splitter and ergo monocular head. However, you must raise this by the correct compensatory amount if you're using the advanced filter block or any filters in any filter block according to the details described earlier in the section on the binocular head. The ergo monocular first surface mirror block is constructed by printing the parts and cleaning them up, ensure they fit together well as shown. Ensure that the recesses for the mirror are particularly clean and free of 3D printing imperfections. Pre-thread the holes with the M3 screws here and here, and the M2 screws here. Now insert the 2cm square full mirror as we did with the binocular head beam splitter, shown in the video on beam splitters and the advanced filter block. This involves inserting a 2cm widening wedge just above the recess for the mirror to widen the walls of the casing, then slip the mirror into the slot ensuring the silvered surface faces the outlet. Once it is well in position, remove the 2cm widening wedge, the penny in this case, and the mirror should now be held in place with minimal pressure. There should not be any rattling with this mirror. It is not supposed to be loose like the beam splitter of the binocular head. Complete the construction by slotting in the top back cover and applying the two M2 screws, then attach the ocular base thread of your choice, left or right sided, but be sure not to include the splitter support wedge in the ocular base thread because this will not fit under the full mirror and you could damage the mirror coating with it. Finally, apply the four M3 screws and the construction is complete. You attach this ergo monocular mirror block to the top of the filter block by screwing it on fully till the lugs line up. If it overshoots a little when fully tightened, just wind it back till the lugs are aligned. Then apply an M3 10mm long screw to the front lug which should thread into the nut in the corresponding lug of the filter block to fix it in place. Now attach the mirror block tube using two shims and M3 screws. These screws are designed to thread into the plastic of the ergo monocular mirror block case outlet so take care not to destroy the threads by over tightening. You should use diametrically opposite pairs of holes. Use the middle ones if they allow the desired rotational angle to be achieved or the more extreme pairs if you need to rotate it even further. To remove the ergo monocular mirror block from the filter block you will need to remove this MBT in addition to removing the fixing screw in the front lug. The ocular mirror block comes in two mirror mount parts, top and bottom. Remove any supports and adhesins and clean up the prints as usual. Pay special attention to the areas that accept the molybdenum mirror. Even slight errors here can make it impossible to properly align the images when used with the binocular head. Ensure the front and upper apertures are clean and free from plastic debris. The plastic thread on the top mirror mount may need to be trained by threading an ocular extension module or lock nut onto it a few times. If you're going to use an eyepiece, complete the assembly with the lock nut and ocular cap 
Remember to use a 15mm ocular extension with a 0.5mm spacer unless you are building the upper arm of the binocular module. Then insert your ocular lens to ensure it goes in without too much pressure. Sand the internal surfaces of the ocular holder if the fit is too tight. Be sure to clear away any plastic dust and sandpaper grit resulting from these cleanup procedures before proceeding to the next steps. You must insert the grub screws into the mirror mount bottom component before you insert the mirror and adjustment screws. Insert the grub screws backwards, that is, from the cut surface of the mount and wind them up into the hole by putting gentle pressure on the grub screw tip while unwinding it from the other side with the allen key. This ensures the screws go in straight. It would be hard to do that if you try to insert them from the external surface because the holes are partial and curvy. When ready, slide in the 25mm diameter molybdenum mirror into this slot in the bottom part. Take care not to touch the reflective surface of the mirror and obviously this surface must face outwards. Slide the top part of the mount over the mirror in the bottom part until they meet. Press them together firmly and fix them in place with the two M3 grub screws. Go slowly with this, making a turn then going back half a turn, etc. to ensure you cut a good thread into the plastic without forcing the two parts of the mount apart. You don't want a gap to form between them. Now cut three 2mm segments of 1.75mm diameter 3D printer filament and insert them into the mirror adjustment holes. After that, insert the M3 adjustment screws, the two long headed screws at the bottom and the grub screw at the top. The filament segments act as protective shims to prevent the metal adjustment screws from directly grinding against the molybdenum of the mirrors and causing metal dust that can get into the scope and damage your optics, as well as make the adjustments ineffective. Bear in mind, you only get a slight adjustment with these screws, so you should aim to get good quality 45 degree surfaces on your prints. Now that the mirror block ocular holder is complete, attach the required ocular holding or C-mount components to the top of it and slide it into the mirror block tube after you have inserted any required spacer rings as described earlier.
place the light shield cap over it with the little shoulder lugs over the top open aspect of the MBT, then hold everything in place with the MBT ring nut, but remember not to make this too tight, to avoid bending the mirror block ocular assembly inwards. Important. When inserting an eyepiece or C-mount reduction optic, it is very important not to put pressure on the connection to the central mirror or splitter block attachment, or it could deform or break. The correct procedure is to hold the bottom of the MBT and apply upwards pressure while you insert the ocular lens or C-mount reduction optic. It is safer to lift the whole scope off the desk with this upwards pressure than to allow downwards pressure to be transmitted to the scope from inserting the ocular optics. This procedure is essential whenever you insert an ocular lens or C-mount reduction optic in any configuration. Even with a simple monocular tube, it is advisable to hold the tube and put upwards counter pressure while you insert an eyepiece, even if it lifts the scope off the desk. For the binocular head module, you insert the optics as described in the video on beam splitters and the advanced filter block. However, the casing has been modified and upgraded since the making of that video, and while most of the assembly instruction there still holds true, there are a few differences which I will now explain. First, note that the newer casing has a much better light shield design for the top and back cover component. There is therefore no need to apply any light blocking tape as was suggested in the previous video. More importantly, however, the position of the beam splitter has been slightly modified for improved performance and, in order to hold the beam splitter in its new higher position, a modification has been made to the ocular base thread that allows a support shelf for the beam splitter to be inserted. The splitter support wedge must be inserted as shown here, with the flat lower aspect of the wedge flush with the flat inner surface of the ocular base thread. You must insert this prior to affixing the ocular base thread in place and ensure the beam splitter is in its raised position prior to applying the ocular base thread. Apart from this, the construction is the same as shown in the prior video. Note that you must only use this support shelf for the beam splitter and not the ergo monocular mirror block as described earlier. Once complete, this splitter block is attached to the filter block and MBTs attached to its outlets as was described previously for the ergo monocular mirror block. Likewise, the placement of the light shield caps and ring nuts and cap spacer arm is as previously described. To build the cap spacer, remove the 3D printing support from the nut arm Force fit an M3 nut into the cavity for it. Then fix the two arms together as shown with an M3 thumb screw made as described in previous videos. Your ocular head assemblies are now complete and ready to use. In other videos, I'll give dedicated instruction on methods and software for image capture using the various adapters described here. The trinocular camera port will also be described in a separate video. Thanks for watching.